turns out, the explosion in sales of factory-produced, traditional, old-fashioned food and drink tells us that the future is the past and it's big business. I think the world has gone mad. Sales of old-fashioned comfort food are up. Corned beef is up 16%. Custard powder, custard powder has doubled. You know, this obsession for nosh nostalgia is simply nonsense. But worse than that, I think it holds our food culture back because we hark back to a golden era that at worst didn't exist and at best was never as good as we thought it was. Take our current nostalgic obsession with cake. When I think of cupcakes, I think home baking, 1950s. You've never had it so good. When I eat it, I think sugar, rotted teeth. They might have tasted good at the time, but they ended up being a real pain in the gums. Nostalgic food disappoints me in so many ways. Take the pasty. Ah, the smell gets me every time. I'm back in my childhood. The sea, a shrimp net in my hand. But it's actually just dough and a really boring filling. The main thing I hate about it is that these foods bear little resemblance to their original robust form. But worse than that, some of our favourite traditional dishes have just been made up. I hate the ploughman's lunch. What a fake. Invented apparently by the English Country Cheese Council. I bet they all wore smocks. Clearly a marketing ploy to sell cheese. And a successful one at that. But really? Does harking back to an imagined past do us any favours? This retreat to the food of our grandparents or great-grandparents is a reaction to the stressful times we live in. But paradoxically, in times of stress, comfort is not our friend. Human evolution depends on innovation. Let's face it, we'd still be eating raw meat if our ancestors hadn't moved on to cooking our food. I think we're way too nervous of the future and need to get our heads out of the past. If we do think that food in the past was great, well, we ignore a lot of facts. Firstly, that quality food was really only for rich people, that two world wars meant decades of rationing, and if we did get hold of some decent vegetables, well, what was our national sport? Ruining them. And who's to blame for much of this? Well, in my view, one lady, Mrs. Isabella Beaton. This book meant the death of culinary sophistication. Not a single one of the thousands of recipes in this tome uses any spices, wine, or even fresh herbs. And she was obsessed with overcooking things. Vegetables that are cooked in a raw state are apt to ferment in the stomach, she said, thereby convincing people to boil vegetables to death, a tradition that lasted well into the 1980s. Don't get me wrong, Mrs Beaton has her place, but we should have more confidence in today. Modern chefs have been busy building new relationships with real heritage foods. We've actually now got a cuisine we can be proud of. I think we should take comfort from that. If I was a psychologist, I'd put you on the couch and I'd say, forget this crazy obsession with foodie nostalgia. Let it go. The important thing is what food tastes like now. So loosen the straitjacket of sticky buns and stodgy pies for a delicious future. Your food culture needs you. There's so much emotion invested in nostalgic food, it's often hard to separate taste and flavour from meaning. Has William really got a point? Well, I'm not sure, you know. I think the thing about nostalgia is the pleasure that it gives me now. And it's kind of irrelevant what happened then. I mean, what I like now, if, I, I, if I'm chatting with my brother and sister and we talk about the times we went to Cornwall and we'd sit and eat pasties for every lunch. I can't really remember how they tasted, but I, what I remember now is that experience. The very fact that we were probably sat in a car park in Cornwall and it was pouring down and I was probably moaning saying, why can't we go to Spain like all my mates? You know, that sort of thing is irrelevant. But then again, we've all had a bad pasty or some overcooked cabbage. If it's bad, then how can it evoke good memories? 
know, but you could say that about anything. The fact that it was bad might make us laugh now. Exactly. That's, that's the main thing, is that exactly. we're having a good time, and it, it maybe it wasn't the best pasty. I mean, that's why the supermarkets have labelled all these dishes, these pies, you know, traditionally baked or handmade or such like. They're selling us this dream. But it's food, it's comfort food, and it's something that I have in my culture. You know, I live away from from Samoa. I don't know any here in the UK. Yeah. And if you take that away, yeah. we know yeah. what do you have? You crave it, exactly. and that's what I find. I yeah. crave it because I'm here, and I don't have the access to that. For example, my cousin lives in Japan. You know, and and when the tsunami hit, you know, he said that all the Japanese were asking people to send was ramen noodles, mm. you know, because mm. it was their comfort food. You know, in their time of need, what do they all have in common? They all related to this one simple food. Mm. Yeah. It's all they wanted. Another example was, was 9-11. Mm. You know, w when that horrible tragedy hit, the people wanted macaroni and cheese. Why? Because they were in need to be comforted and this is what they wanted. It's called comfort food for that reason. So I have to disagree with them. I have to disagree. Yeah. Talking of comfort food, if I gave you a fiver, what would you get for that fiver as comfort food? I would buy a big bag of crisps. Really? Yeah. Good crisps, salt and vinegar preferably. Monica? I, I do like salt and vinegar crisps, I do, but chocolate wins hands down for you me. You see, if I had five pounds, I, I, I'd go out and buy the best, darkest chocolate, even if it was only a mouthful. But ah, the hit of cocoa solids and, and just let it melt in the mouth. And, mm. That's your comfort food, is it? It is, but yeah. there oh, is something brilliant. else that I'm really partial to, and that's instant custard. Wow, instant custard, there's a revelation. I'm guessing it's childhood memories of school. Now, I used to hate the skin on the custard, but actually push the skin away. And, and that custard was so good, it was lovely. In fact, I just had a bowl of it. And I'm not alone. Comforting puddings are coming back. Out in the cold for so many years, it seems that now old-fashioned British stodgy puds are back on the world's menus. Matthew is a fan of British puds, but I'm a Frenchman, and in France, desserts don't get more nostalgic than Ile Flottante, poached meringues on a crème anglaise. It looks and tastes impressive, and is not as hard to make as you might imagine. It's a French classic, and it's one that I love. It's homely, it's warm, and it's, it is incredibly simple, and I'm going to show you how simple it is. Monica, if you could crack the eggs, I need eight egg yolks, eight egg whites in the machine, and 190 grams of sugar. Right, so we're talking meringues. We are talking meringues. Scary for me. Why? No, what part is scary? I don't know, burning them or what you put in there. Do you put vinegar in? You know, that sort of thing. I just would be... It just makes me nervous. No, these are really very, very simple. And they're poached so that you don't have to dry them out in the oven. Okay. They're, they're, they're light and fluffy and they're going to be covered in caramel. So they've got that lovely crunchy texture on the outside, gooey in the middle and creamy and unctuous with the creme anglaise. No corn flour, no vinegar, just egg white and sugar. It's so simple. Everybody can make this, trust me. Creme anglaise, classic, and it's going to be flavoured with vanilla. One of my all-time favourite spices. It, it's just so heavenly. It's, this sings out French patisserie. A really lush vanilla pod is worth spending the extra money on. You'll smell why the moment you scrape the seeds out. Simmer the vanilla in 750 ml of milk without bringing to the boil before adding 190 grams of sugar to eight egg yolks. So you need to whisk that up so as it goes to a lovely nice white ribbon then you pour the boiling milk over. A little bit at first, so we know what's going to happen otherwise. Scrambled eggs? That's right, we don't want scrambled eggs. Whisk the milk in before putting the custard back in the pan and heat until it thickens. Finally, the meringues. Add another 190 grams of sugar to the remaining eight egg whites and whisk until the peaks are smooth and glossy. I'm not weighing the sugar, so I've got years and years of experience. And I can tell by the silkiness and the consistency of the egg white when to stop. And I've got a sweet tooth, so I always put an extra spoonful in. There we go. Lovely. That looks so good. Silky white, perfect meringue. Looking good. You want to come and join yeah, us, Kate? I'd love to. So. Watch the action. Watch the action. Yeah. Right, Kate, okay. here goes the caramel. So you've just poured the sugar in 
And yep, off you this go. Is yep. Straight caramel, this, and it's just the sugar. It's what we call, you know, chef world, a dry caramel. Because there's no liquid in it, it won't crystallize. crystallize. Okay. okay. So, this you can actually stir. So, if you see it's getting too dark on one side and it's not enough caramel on one side, stir it around. Going. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And you okay. see, I've pulled it off the heat because uh, chef's a bit slow today and I've got to wait for him to finish cooking <laughs> his. Uh... <laughs> My lovely floating islands. They're looking good, I have to say. I'll give you that. They look They're good. Beautiful. They do look good. So we've just got egg whites and sugar here. Yep. And I'm shaping them into these lovely yeah. floating islands, dipped into the milk and sugar mix there that's been slightly sweetened. And they poach away. It really is so simple. They look fantastic. So there we go. And we just poach them very, very gently. Okay. Mustn't boil, because if it boils, the egg white will puff up and then they'll collapse. Right. So what would you recommend so with this great. then, Kate? Well, it looks quite elegant, but I would want an equally elegant drink to go with it, I think. And I think for that, there's only one choice, personally. What would that and be? I would love to drink with this a champagne. Yes. Now, obviously, with champagne, naturally, you think, oh, champagne, it's an aperitif, it's a, you know, something dry. But actually, there's some fantastic, what's called demi-sec champagnes. Mm. So they're a touch sweeter. They've got a nice honey character. And I just think it would be a really nice match. If not a champagne, then perhaps a nice dessert and a muscat, something nice and aromatic, nice and fragrant, a little bit of sort of apricot type characters. Nothing too dominant that's going to overwhelm it, but you need that sweetness there to to match the sweetness in the dessert. After five minutes poaching in some milk and sugar, remove the meringues and leave them to cool on a wire rack. And they should be firm, but light, before drizzling with the caramel and gently placing on the custard. Whee! That is a sound <laughs> I, I so like. Yes. Ready? The combination of textures makes this the perfect dessert. The light and fluffy meringue, crunchy caramel and creamy custard sauce. Delicious. You need to crack, crack it. it. Oh, I like That's it. it. It's a good sharing dessert, isn't it? You it know, is. all get stuck in and I like food like that. And it's, it's all great. about textures as well. Mmm. Mmm. Mm. That champagne just works so well because it is so rich, it just cleans the palate, doesn't it, at the end? Cleans the mouth out, makes it feel nice and fresh. It just I'm very pleased with that. I love it. I love yeah. the freshness that champagne brings to this. And it is a very sweet dessert, isn't it? It really very is. Sweet. It really is. I love the crunch on it as well. Mm. Mm. This is heavenly. Good. That's good to hear. I'm pleased. 